Hello YouTube, I'm John Hipsley. I'm a historian, published author, and I'm a tour guide, and I've been offering tours of my historic city of Canterbury in Kent since 1991, and I love to share history and things that seem to make sense to everyone. Here follows a reminder of how our ancestors lived and what they had to go through on a daily basis. The next time you're washing your hands because of the dreaded COVID-19 and hear yourself complain to yourself because the water temperature is just how you like it, just think how it used to be. And here are some interesting facts from the 14th and 15th centuries. Most people got married in June and they took their yearly bath in May. The rainwater was gathered in a barrel in April when the big rains came. And they smelled quite fresh by June. Generally, they got married on the 21st of June, the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. Before the Christians came, the Celts used to only be married for a year and a day. They used to come back to the same spot to see if they were still together. If they were still together after a year and a day, a blood match was made by slicing the palms of the hand open and then holding the palm to palm and tying them together with a Hessian knot, hence the expression tying the knot. However, since they were starting to smell a bit, the brides often carried a bouquet of flowers to hide the stench of their own body odor and that of their husband's breast. Hence the custom today of still carrying a bouquet of flowers when getting married. Baths were considered bad taste and they often only had a bath once a year. The bath consisted of a big barrel of water containing cold water and the man of the house had the privilege of the nice clean water then his sons, and then the women of the family, and the daughters, and then finally the little children, and least of all, the babies. By the time of the end of the bath, the water was so dirty you could actually lose somebody in it, hence the expression, don't throw the baby out of the bath water. Houses had thatched roofs, thick straw piled high with no real wood underneath. It was the only place for animals to get warm, and so cats and dogs and other small animals like mice and bugs often lived in the roof. When it rained, however, this became slippery, and sometimes those animals would slip and fall out of the roof onto the ground. Hence the expression, it's raining cats and dogs. There was nothing to stop things falling from the ceiling into the house, and this posed a real problem in the bedroom, where bugs and other droppings could mess up your nice clean bed. People often slept on the floor, but some richer people preferred to sleep on a horsehair mattress. This was still true into the 20th century. Often their night was disturbed by bugs and droppings falling into their mouth during sleep, but this is best rectified by hanging a sheet from the ceiling beams to catch the droppings. Sometimes slightly more secure by supported from beams attached to the corners of the bed, or as we call four poster beds. The Georgians often added a curtain pulled round the bed for added warmth in the winter period. Hence, a bed with four big posts and a heat chunk above it created some form of protection. And that's really how canopy beds started to come into existence. The floor of most houses was just dirt, and only really wealthy people could have something different than dirt, hence the expression dirt poor. Wealthy people often had slate floors, which would often get slippery during the winter when wet. So they often spread thresh, basically straw, on the floor to help them in their footing. In the winter, as the winter wore on, they added more and more straw until often when they opened the door, the thresh would slip outside. And so a piece of wood was placed in the entranceway to stop the thresh getting outside, hence the expression of threshold. In those sort of days, they cooked everything in a pot in the kitchen, basically a kettle hung over an open fire. Every day they lit the fire and added things to the pot. They ate mostly vegetables and couldn't get much meat. They would often eat the stew for dinner and lunch and uh, evening meal, and leaving the leftovers in the pot to get cold overnight, and then start the stew again the next morning. Sometimes, however, the stew had a bit of uh, meat in it, but they could uh, leave that in there for quite a while. Hence the rhyme, peas pottage hot, peas pottage cold, peas pottage in the pot, five days old. Sometimes they would obtain some pork, and if they were lucky, they felt really quite special. Visitors would come over, and they would hang up a bit of bacon outside to show it off, hence the sign, that the wealthy men could bring home the bacon. They would often cut off the uh, fat bit and chew that while they chatted to their friends, and that was called chewing the fat. Still used today. Those people with money had plates made of pewter. Most people ate off of wooden plates. A food with a high acidic content often caused the lead to leach out into the food, causing lead poisoning or equivalent to death. This most happened now with tomatoes, and so for the next 400 years or so, tomatoes were considered poisonous, and some people still think them poisonous. Bread was divided according to status. Workers got the burnt bottom of the loaf, the family got the middle, and the guests got the top, or the upper crust. 
We now drink most of our stuff out of glass, don't we? But in the old days, they used to use lead cups to drink uh, ale and whiskey. The combination would often sometimes knock out the people who drank, and uh, often for a couple of days. Sometimes people walking down the street would see the people in the side of the road look like they were dead drunk and would actually prepare them for burial. They were laid out of the kitchen table with their new shoes put upon them. Hence the expression today, new shoes and a kitchen table means death in the family. Some people are very superstitious about that. And the family would gather around the uh, dead person and eat and drink just in case they did wake up. Hence the expression holding awake. And if they did wake up, they had a fantastic party. England is old and small. There's no doubt about it. People still want to come here, though. And the local folk in uh, the medieval period often found that they were running out of places to bury people. So they would often dig up coppins and uh, take the bones out and put them in a bone house or ossuary and reuse the grave. Often, when opening the coffin lids, they found at least one in 25 coffins had scratch marks on the inside, and so they realised they might well have been burying people alive. So they would uh, often tie a string to the wrist of the corpse, lead it through the coffin and up through the ground, and tie it to a bell. Someone would have to sit in the graveyard all night, the graveyard shift, to listen to the bell. Thus someone could be saved by the bell, or considered to be a dead ringer. They used to use urine to tan animal skins, or hides. So families used to pee in a pot, and then once a day, that would be taken and sold to the tannery. If you could survive on this, you were known as piss poor. Worse still were those really poor folk who couldn't afford even a pot to buy, and so they wouldn't have a pot to piss in. They really were the lowest of the low. I hope you've enjoyed this little uh, launch into English phraseology and uh, how it fits into English history. And if you happen to come to Canterbury in the near future, I'd recommend you book up one of my tours, the Hidden City Tour of Canterbury, or better still, buy a copy of my book. Links in the description. Please subscribe. Thank you.